Hey, welcome back everybody. This is your first lecture on our biochemistry unit and we will start with a topic uh, that I like to call the structure of matter. So in biochemistry we'll be doing exactly what the, the unit name sounds like. We will be studying kind of a combination of biology and chemistry. So really at a fundamental level we'll be exploring how chemistry and some really really basic concepts in chemistry make life or biology even possible in the first place. And we'll start here with this lecture on the structure of matter um, and this is a pretty you know kind of straightforward diagram to start with because over here on the right hand side it shows this term matter so matter is just a, a vocabulary term that that defines basically everything in our known universe um, unless you want to get me started on uh, antimatter and some theoretical physics stuff which you shouldn't because I know nothing about it so for our intents and purposes in biology matter is everything uh, really, the technical definition of matter is anything that has mass and anything that takes up space. And it doesn't really matter if that mass is really, 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 really tiny. And it doesn't really matter if the space that it takes up is really, 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 really tiny as long as it has some sort of mass and takes up some sort of space, or in other words, has some sort of volume, we say that it is classified as matter. So if we work our way kind of this direction on this uh, diagram, we'll basically be seeing what this unit will be about, or sorry, this, this uh, topic, this lesson will be about here for the next few minutes. So starting with matter, and they're just using this, this um, example of a block in this person's hand as matter. It fits the definition, it has mass, you could, you could take its mass on a scale, um, and it takes up space. It's obviously taking up space in that person's hand. What you can't necessarily see from this picture is this second diagram right here. What makes up this block? What makes up our matter? And the answer is at a, at a, at a very, very, very tiny level, at a fundamental level, all matter is composed of your next vocabulary term, atoms. All matter is composed of atoms. So we consider atoms to be what we call the building block of matter, the smallest unit of matter. And you stick a bunch of atoms together and that's how you get things like blocks that you hold in your hand. Okay. So an atom is considered the building block of matter. However, atoms are not the smallest thing that exists in our universe. So even though we consider, and here in this diagram these individual circles each represent an atom, even though we say they are the building blocks of matter, there are actually smaller things that make up atoms. So the rest of this lesson will be uh, devoted to understanding how smaller things like electrons and protons and neutrons, smaller things like that that actually go into an atom. So if you look right here, like this is supposed to be an atom and the atom itself has smaller pieces. So these three smaller pieces, uh, electrons, uh, protons, and neutrons, we will be studying in greater detail um, over the next few slides. So here we're just looking at um, a, a more detailed picture of an atom, of that building block of matter. So this whole thing, this whole diagram right here, represents, as you can see down below, an atom of carbon. And carbon is a really, really, really important atom or important element in biology because it's considered the, the backbone of biology. It's what all biological material is at a, at a uh, root level composed of, composed of these carbon atoms. So this is a good uh, atom to study. This slide is meant to show you those tinier, even smaller pieces that make up an atom. Remember, the atom is considered the building block of matter. All matter is made of atoms but there are smaller pieces to atoms. So there's even tinier things that, that we need to understand in order to understand uh, how atoms are composed. So this slide is meant to show you what those tinier pieces are. So we'll actually start in kind of this central part of the atom, this middle portion right here. And you'll see there's two different colored spheres. There's these red spheres, and then there's these blue spheres. And the blue spheres have a plus sign in them or a positive sign. And the red spheres don't have any sign in them at all. Okay. Well, this central part of the atom, which I've circled in red, is known as the atom's nucleus. And inside the nucleus, we find two of our three subatomic, sub meaning below or less than, atomic meaning an atom. So a subatomic, a less than atom 
particle. These are subatomic particles, and there are two of them in this central part of the atom known as the nucleus. Those two are protons, which are subatomic particles found in the nucleus that have a positive charge, which is why they have that plus sign in the middle of them. The other subatomic particle that you find in the nucleus of an atom is called a neutron. So we have protons and we have neutrons hanging out together in this central nucleus. Now notice the neutrons don't have any type of sign in the middle of them. That's because they have a neutral charge. They're neutral. In other words, if we were to put a, some type of sign in the middle of them, I would recommend putting a zero, meaning they have zero charge. They are non-charged particles. Okay, so those two exist together. The protons and the neutrons exist together in the neutral, uh, excuse me, in the nucleus, the central portion of this atom. Now, look around the outside of the nucleus. In the outside of the nucleus, we have these green spheres with the minus sign in the middle of them. Okay, so these are zipping around the outside of the nucleus of an atom, and these subatomic particles are called electrons. So electrons are subatomic particles that have a negative charge. So protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, or they have zero charge, and electrons are negatively charged subatomic particles. Now, an important thing to understand here is that there's multiple shells or orbitals or levels that these electrons fit into. So this first circle here represents orbital number one. And then there's a second circle out wider than it that represents orbital number two. And there's certain rules that these electrons fill or uh, abide by when they try to fill up these orbitals. Okay, This first orbital is maxed out when it has two electrons in it. Okay, so we can see one electron here, we can see one electron here in this first orbital, so it's full. Okay, the second orbital likes to have a total of eight electrons in it. And if you count our electrons in this second circle, this second orbital outside the nucleus, I count one, then I count two, then I count three, then I count four. So in a, in a carbon atom, there's only four of these eight electrons in the outermost, or what we call the valence orbital. Okay? That means that carbon is missing four electrons. It would love to have an electron right there, right there, right there, and right here. It has four electrons in that outer shell, but it wants to have eight. It's missing four even though it already has four. And that's what makes carbon such a, such a fundamental element of life is because it's missing these four electrons. And the electrons, as you'll see in the next couple slides, are what dictates the way that one atom uh, uh, interacts with or behaves when other atoms are around. So because carbon is missing these four electrons in its outermost shell, we call it its valence shell, it interacts um, in some interesting ways when other atoms are around. And before we revisit how carbon um, interacts with various atoms because of those electrons and the way its electrons are configured, a couple more general vocabulary terms we want to talk about here. So each one of these um, colored balls, here's uh, two blue, okay, and then one red, these represent atoms. Okay, so these are individual atoms. Now here, we have kind of these white bars that are joining these atoms together. Okay, So total in this picture, we have three atoms. Here's one atom, here's two atoms, and here are three atoms. But these white bars joining them together, at least in this picture, represent something called the chemical bond. And a chemical bond is a force, an attraction, that sticks atoms together in order to make larger substances. This whole thing you might recognize as H and H. There's two H's and there's one O. So there's two atoms of hydrogen and there's one atom of oxygen. So you might recognize this as H2O or water, but we would call this a water molecule. So even though it has hydrogen atoms and it has an oxygen atom, these white bars between them represent chemical bonds. And chemical bonds just stick 
multiple atoms together in order to make one large structure known as a molecule. So we have three atoms in this picture, two chemical bonds, that's those white bars, and one overall molecule. And now we just want to end this lecture by talking about some of the specific types of chemical bonds that can stick different atoms together in order to make much larger molecules. So let's actually focus on this bottom one first. We have uh, uh, kind of some bonding here represented by these red arrows, and then we have a different uh, variety of bonds represented by these blue arrows. So let's focus on the red arrows first. This is a type of bond known as a covalent bond. So remember I said that electrons, which are around the outside of the nucleus, and in these pictures are the purple dots now, they will dictate how different atoms uh, correspond to each other, how they relate to each other, how they behave when other atoms are around. Okay? In a covalent bonding situation, like we have in the bottom half of this picture, Atoms will share electrons, and that's the important part here. Covalent means sharing electrons. They share electrons in order to get to that point, like we said carbon likes to be at, where their outer shell has a total of eight electrons. Now the exception here is hydrogen. Hydrogen only likes to have two electrons in its outer shell. So this hydrogen atom has, has one electron, okay? And this hydrogen atom has one electron. And then if you look at this oxygen atom and you count the electrons in its outer shell, it has one, two, three, four, five, six. But it wants to have eight, so it's missing two. Well, the obvious solution here is it's actually going to share with hydrogen. Okay, So oxygen has six electrons, and if it shares this electron with hydrogen, and it shares this electron with hydrogen, and you now, in this last picture count, you have one, two, three, four, eight five, six, seven, eight electrons around that oxygen atom, and you have one, two around this hydrogen, and another one, two around this hydrogen. So covalent bonding, they shared their electrons. These atoms shared their electrons in order to form chemical bonds that made a larger molecule. A different type of bonding is known as ionic bonding. And in ionic bonding, instead of sharing electrons, uh, atoms will completely donate or completely receive. There's a complete transfer of electrons that takes place in an ionic bond. So instead of sharing, they're transferring. So let's look at the case of what we're trying to make here is sodium chloride, NaCl. That's just salt. That's the salt that you pour on your french fries to make them taste yummy. Okay? But let's look at sodium all by itself. Sodium all by itself has this one electron shell with only one electron in it. And chlorine has an electron shell that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons in it. Man, seven. It really, really, really badly wants to have eight. Okay? So there's an easy solution. When sodium just has this one kind of loner electron, it would actually rather get rid of it. Because if it gets rid of this electron, it's back to having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons in its now outermost shell, its valent shell, if it just gets rid of this one. If chlorine could somehow just get an electron from somewhere, it would be happy because its outermost shell would have eight. So they don't want to share. That doesn't really help them, but sodium will just completely donate and give up its electron, and that will make sodium happy, and chlorine will happily take that electron in. Okay, When that happens, because that electron is a negative charge, the sodium got rid of a negative. Therefore, it became positive. And because the chlorine picked up an extra negative, it became negatively charged. And you guys have known for a long time that opposites attract each other. So we have a now a positively charged sodium and we have a negatively charged chlorine because the sodium completely gave one of its electrons to chlorine. And because they have opposite charges, they will stick together to make sodium chloride molecule. So in a covalent bond, we share electrons to stick atoms together. But in an ionic bond, we completely give up an electron from one atom to another in order to stick them together to make these larger molecules.